Knowing the, the strictness of, of Amish church, what was the circumstance that led to you guys uh, leaving that church? Um, there was a uh, fellow that I worked with in the logging and the lumber industry that we kind of got to sharing um, our life stories. And, and uh, first of all, he was working with my older brother in the sawmill business. And for about 10 years, going on timber tours that I didn't know about until um, one day he, uh, um, my brother came to me and you know I, I read a lot of fishing and hunting stories and and he knew I was a bookworm and, and so on and he one day him and I were walking together and he said I think I have a book that you'd be interested in and I got real curious as what for book so he said he was really slow in answering he said uh, an English Bible <laughs> I'm like, English Bible? What, what's, what's the matter with my brother? What's going on with him? Because uh, in our community, we were raised on the German Bible. Okay. And uh, we do have the English Bible, the 1611 translation, the, the old King James. Okay. Uh, but we were discouraged in studying it. We could look to that to understand a word in the German. But anyways, um, it was a, we were, the church, the Amish church was kind of going through a struggle in as far as farming, how you farm and so on. And there was a lot of issues rising through that uh, as, as allowing more, more like milking machines and stuff like that because the Amish milk by hand. Okay. And the church was going through struggling whether it allowed him or not. And, and the king, some people went ahead and put them in and, and others were fighting to keep that from happening. And. And in that process, there was um, different people from the church that had to um, get rid of the machine because they went on ahead without the minister's per the, the minister's permission or the church. So they had kind of got him to get rid of all the milking machines and, and kind of do confession and apologize that they did this without approval from the bishop right. and the leaders. So in that process, I got real upset with the church that I was living, uh, grow, uh, grew up in and uh, I was upset it seemed like the <clears throat> excuse me it seemed like the ministers were always getting their their way or the people that are as members that are always pulling back on how we how we progress in being able to make a living and anyway they got to everybody kind of do a confession that one I hadn't got these these this equipment and and I was very upset with the ministry. I was very upset in the position I was in, and I was just in a very uh, restless mode. And, uh, and while at the same time, my boss, which my older brother Rufus, uh, was in uh, kind of in, in a partnership in some way with uh, Samuel in the logging business. Mm -hmm. And here, the Mennonite guy was uh, ministering to my brother. He was uh, he was the um, forester. And he was ministering to him for about 10 years, and I didn't know it until, you know, my brother started talking about it in this English Bible, and I'm like, this is not allowable in the Amish community. So I got very, uh, kind of, my wheels started turning in my own mind, and, and one day uh, he invited him up, in the house, up to his house to babysit their children, and he was going to leave for the day, and my wife and I arrived to his house, and, and I just, anyway, asked my brother, can I have that Bible? I'd like to read that Bible. So he reached up and got it down. It was an NIV with footnotes. So I started reading through the Old Testament, and I was, I was just shocked how easy it is to read the Bible in English in a language that we I understood more than I did the German. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot of teaching in the German, but we did go to school to do your uh, the mass in English and all that, and and learned how to speak English. But uh, to have a Bible the first time in my hands that I could read and understand, I was just thrilled and, and, and excited. But I knew at the same time, this is disapproved in my church that I grew up. So how do I deal with this? So uh, just just keep it to myself and my brother and not talk to anybody else about it. So uh, the, the, the time went on, I, I really started reading. And I remember that I was pretty much all day, I was reading that Bible and I was just totally shocked how easy it is yeah. to read it and understand. And I'd go and read the bottom of the footnotes and just gives you a more of an insight understanding what it's talking about. So that evening when he came home I said, I want to have a Bible as soon as I can. So in about a week later 
here arrives this forester in our office and hands me my first English Bible, the New King James Nelson Study Bible. Uh -huh. And at the bottom was written, Stephen and Susie, Romans 12, 1 and 2. All right. That was very special. So I took it home and I stuck my nose in it and I just started reading it and and uh, we the, the sawmill moved to another new location and it happened to be that it's right where he was working. So in the mornings he'd come out in front and ask me, well, what are you reading? At different times I was embarrassed because I just hadn't been reading lately, but uh, I, I, I'd go home and say, now tonight I'm going to really read and I'm going to have a question for him in the morning. And uh, so fast forward, uh, it kind of takes too long to... <laughs> but anyway, it's okay. uh, as time went on, one morning I met him at the, uh, no, sorry, one weekend we had some friends from Lancaster come to the cabin right beside our house. And they were talking about when they were saved, and they were talking, and the other guy was talking about when he was saved, and the other guy is, 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 is talking about his mom when she was saved, and yet his father and his mother had a divorce and weren't living together anymore. Yeah. And and they were talking about how they're saved. In the Amish community, you're not allowed to know. There's no way that you can know that you get to heaven. Okay. They say there's no way that you can know. We only hope we get to heaven. Okay. So I thought, okay, I have a question when I get to work next morning to ask my, the, the forester. Um, so I came the next morning, and of course, you know, with all the other rest of the Amish in the, in the break room, I don't dare ask any questions in front of them, so... I waited until everybody went out to work, and I was kind of slow in leaving, and, and since this forester was still in the office, I said, hey, I got a question, as he was about ready to get ready to leave himself. I said, we were to have a discussion Saturday night at this cabin right beside us, and so-and-so, well, Mark was saying that when he was saying, and Lloyd was saying he was, when, when he was saving, and when his mom was saved, I said, can you really know that, that you can get to heaven, for sure? And he just started, gone down the list of all the promises of God in the New Testament. And I was so shocked to hear someone spit out truth from the Bible without even holding a Bible mm. or reading out of the Bible within his hand. Right. I didn't, I was so shocked. I, I can't even remember to this day even what all he said, but he said a lot of truth out of the Bible. And, and, and when he was done, I said, Okay, tell me, is it okay to have, have a, a, a telephone or is it okay to have a phone? Because in the Amish community, it's always, always our, you can't have this, you can't have that, you're not allowed to have that, you can't allow that. So my mind was just wrapped in this Amish setting of do's and don'ts and things, what you can have and what you can't have. So my mind wasn't really tuned in towards the Bible, but it was in some way, but yet I was still concerned. I wish I could have these subtle ones, whether it's right to have a phone or whether it's right to have a television or what, whatever. And he just looked at me and said, uh, I, I, don't jump, I don't know, I jumped in this pickup and left. And I'm like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> but anyway, I was, it did, but the, the, the story that he, he shared with me from the Bible, the, the promises, I was so shocked what he knew that I, I, even, I couldn't even remember barely what he said. But there was enough of curiosity rising up in my mind that what all does this guy know that I should know? And just by being around him, I wanted to be around him more because here seems to be a guy that had a lot of wisdom instead of saying like a lot of people previously did, mm -hmm. say, you need to come to our church. You need to remove yourself from the Amish church. Or, right. The Bible doesn't say you can't have a, have a car. The Bible doesn't say you can't have four. The Bible doesn't say you can't have this and that. He never addressed those issues. Mm -hmm. He always went straight to the Bible. So the next time we came to get, uh, we got together again at the office was on a, like on a morning, so on like a Monday morning after I'd been to church, the Amish church. I don't remember what all my, my questions were, but I remember I came coming to the office and say, well, yesterday he talked about that we need to have um, a, a church where, where the ministers are put in order and we know that we need an ordinance or, or, or rules to keep us out of the, out of the, world mm -hmm. we know that they might not get a, keep us they might not get us to heaven but if we don't have have wolf we might not get to heaven it's a it's kind of like a mixed up understanding not getting a clear understanding mm -hmm. we thought we were understanding what it means to get to heaven but yet we knew we also had to have rules so you never really got the clear picture of understanding what it meant to 
get to heaven. So a lot of it was based on your works. Yes, a lot of works. A lot of works. And so as time went on, um, I, I, would just, I was just so confused and trying to sort things out. I used to come to the office over and over because he would always be sitting at the computer and sending emails overseas because he did a lot of missions overseas. So one day I came to the office again, I said, well, what do I do? The, 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 the minister says that we need to have an ordinance to keep us separate from the world. I just asked him these questions over and over. He'd say, Steve, look, we, we, we we're focusing on the cross, why Jesus came down to the earth, why God sent his son into the world to die for us. We're trying to focus on, put our focus on who he is, why he came, why he died for us, and all that. We're not, all this other stuff is way, way out here. I think we need to focus and talk about who Jesus is. And he would repeatedly over and over go back to the Bible. He'd always open the Bible and turn around and, 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 and lay it right in front of me and say, read here. And I, I just didn't understand how he always knew where to go mm. or what scriptures to point out for, to answer my questions. So this kind of went on and on and on until one day he went to, uh, in the chapter in Ezekiel, we talked about the, the shepherd not taking care of the sheep. And he, he handed that Bible to me and turned around and said, read this, this chapter here. And he goes down through and talks about the shepherds would only clothe themselves and they would, they would t feed themselves not taking care of the flock. And he talked about how the flock was scattered for lack of, lack of a shepherd, how they were scattered all over the, the hillsides and so on and on. And then later on in the chapter talks about how um, God would bring his sheep together again mm -hmm. through his servant David. And he'll take them on a, on a, on a green pasture on a hillside and, and gather himself. And that instant, at that instant, I got the picture. I, I, I couldn't hold my tears back anymore. I said, I got it. I, I just took off and went out to work. And I was a lumber grader, so I was grading lumber, and I was just, tears were coming down my eyes and going down my face. And I was just like, I, I was praying, God, I want everything that you have for me to understand. I want to follow you. I want to do everything you ever asked me to do. It's just like all of a sudden my eyes just open. Understand, I knew now that the Word of God is the truth to go by yeah. and to live by. It was just all of a sudden my eyes were opened. Okay. All these other things are, are earthly things. And this is talking about eternal things. That's why we had a mis misconception for years and years and years. We were mixing Bible with our works. Right. Therefore that muddies up all the water. Yes. Therefore we never have a clear picture and understanding what goes on. Yeah. Well, Susie, let me ask you this. Um, as Steve's gone through this wrestling and questioning and whatnot, were you two discussing uh, what was going on and when he came to this realization and shared it with you? What were, you, what were your thoughts and feelings? What was going on in your mind? Um, when, well, when the foresters started talking to him, he would come home and tell me what they talked about, and pretty much I knew what was going on. Okay. One thing that he did that was different from some Amish homes. He he was the kind of guy that I trusted before we ever came to that place. That's great. So if he came home and, you know, told me this stuff that told me what they talked about, I trusted him because I trusted him before. And to be honest, my sister accused me before we were even Christians about I trust everything my husband says. Pretty soon he'll dr he'll drag me off to whatever. And today she'd probably think it's true. <laughs> and so that was a big thing that helped me to believe, you know, when he would come home and start sharing what they talked about. The second thing was when I met this guy, I was like, there is something different about him. I have never met anybody that Whatever he says, that's what he does. Mm. That's what he lives. I wasn't used to that. Okay. I wasn't used to somebody ex doing exactly what they said, and that's what they lived. Th he didn't just tell us the truth. He lived it. Amen. And I was like, I never saw anybody like this before. And Very now true. I say it was the spirits telling us it's true. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because yes. I just never saw anybody like that. That's what made me come to the conclusion that there is something about this. Right. There is something about this. I mean, 
I know that the Holy Spirit Spirit reveals it to us, but right. that's what was a big eye opener for me. And he didn't come and say, "You have to do this." He introduced the Bible to us. Okay. And he didn't tell us you have to go here. That's where Jesus is. He brought Jesus to our house. If that makes sense. Yes, makes perfect sense. He was yes. Jesus for a little while. Led by example. In yes. our house. So, that's what made the difference for me. So that would be different from a lot of um, Christian marriages, or excuse me, Amish marriages, that he didn't come in and tell you what to do. That would be normal. That that would be. Uh, the husband would tell the wife what they were going to do. In a lot of homes, it is like that. Okay. The wives have to listen to what the husband says and do that. So you, even if he sits there and say, "Bring me breakfast, bring me whatever," <laughs> right? I mean, to that extent. Right. So you watched his example all along, mm -hmm. even before this, and that trust just continued to grow and grow mm -hmm. and deepen for you. Well, that's that's powerful right there—an example. God's made you the high priest of the home. And you certainly have, you know, done your best to fill that role. And your wife's testimony is powerful in that regard. That's that's, and that's going to be powerful to other people, Amish or not. That's going to be powerful for other people. So, the changes in your life. Let's talk about a little. How much has your life changed since you've left the Amish church now and oh my. joined the Mennonite church? Been a long time talking about that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, one thing. Um, we were Amish. It's all about making a living. And I was told by my grandfather that you work hard, save up your money for when you're old. Well, to this day, I hardly have saved up the, a penny because there's way too much help around us. Missions to be filled, mm. uh, given to. Yes. Um, we find out that I, when I think about the Bible, it talks about not to worry about tomorrow mm -hmm. or lay up for yourself treasures for our own, you know, for mm -hmm. ourselves, but lay up your treasure in heaven. So what does that mean? Sharing the gospel, sharing your, whatever God blesses, as, uh, as God progresses us, mm -hmm. uh, we progress in giving and, and, and uh, sharing the Bible. We, <laughs> very different. We have uh, at least two Bible studies we go to uh, once a week. Well, one Bible study is every two weeks, Monday night, and the, one, uh, the second one is every Wednesday night, and now we have one in New York. We try to go to once a month, Friday okay. night. So okay. we drive Friday night. It's a three and a half hour drive and, and then drive back again that same night. A Bible study my cousin started up in New York, Penyan area. So our life has really changed. And I tell you, there's my visions, my focuses, uh, my everything has totally changed from what it was when I was Amish. Always, your Amish views was raising a family and teaching them everything about what it means to make a living and live the Amish life. And and your your fear always was that you would teach them good enough so would, they would always stay Amish, remain, remain Amish. Mm -hmm. And when my grandfather was uh, on his deathbed, in so called what we call in the Amish term, was about dying, he had cancer. Mm -hmm. I went to visit him one evening. He said, Stephen, if there's ever any divisions in the Amish community as far as disagreements and the church divides, be sure that you always stay back the, with the more conservative one. And I thought, that's wonderful. I'll always remember that. Look where I'm at today. Mm. My focuses and my dreams have all, all as Paul talks about, uh, is pretty much rubbish. I mean, it's, yes. there's no value in it. Because God has a has a focus, a new focus, and a new dream for us, which is Jesus Himself and be His followers. Amen. What are He calls in, us into? So our life has changed, our family has changed. We've lost all, basically, ninety nine percent of our Amish friends that we've had because mm. nobody wants to do with what we have. Okay. So um, everything is is changed. Um, lost of our, all of our Amish friends. Mm -hmm. And because nobody, wa nobody wants to be labeled as we. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to step out. Even if they do uh, kind of get a glimpse of what we're doing might be the right thing. Uh, but they don't want nothing to do with it. But we have gained huh, double, triple the friends that we used to have. We've made new friends. We have made, yeah, we just, it's like sometimes you think you have too many friends. Because it, just, it seems like you just can't get to meet them all in a in a routine that right. you'd like to, right. but you always have to think. Well, what is God doing? What is God calling into? Into, so 
yes, our children are starting to um, end up in different areas. Our oldest son wants to go to Alaska, work at a Bible uh, Echo Bible Ranch okay. this summer, and our daughter's working in Gator Camp in Florida. So life has really changed. God, it's like God has a new agenda for us, That's a wonderful. new fo focus yes. for us. And uh, now be involved in the, in the church that we go to. Um, there's lots of a uh, lots of uh, lots of need for teaching the Bible and for ministry around us everywhere. Wow, wow. Susie, may I ask it, it, on that? Is there anything else you could add from your perspective of change that um, that you've seen? Well, in one sense, our life has changed everything. Okay. All together. Up, up, upset, right? Turned upside yeah, down. Yeah, okay. because the way that we used to live, the way that we now now live, the way that we dress, everything. I mean, when I was still, when we were still Amish, I made practically all of our clothes. Okay. Most, every, most everything was done by hand. So, I was just always busy. I mean, there was sewing to do, if nothing else. And there was just so much to do. And I remember uh, talking to him one time. We were on our way to go visit somebody. I said, well, there's one good thing about not having a car. At least we have an hour to get there, and that's one time that you and I can talk without four other, a house full of other people. That's a good point. Because after we became believers, there was night after night after night that there was people at our house. and. We didn't have a lot of time to just talk by ourselves right. about what we were dis learning in the Bible or what Jesus was speaking to us or that kind of thing. So that was one thing that I thought, well, and now I think, well, I'm not sure how I'd get things done. It would take forever to go somewhere with a buggy <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but yes, it has changed a whole lot. I mean, when I was Amish, we were taught that going house to other people's houses and having Bible studies and prayer time is wrong. You don't do that. You do that in your own house, in your own heart. Okay. Nobody needs to hear what you pray or what you think or that kind of thing. So now we are involved in a lot of things like that and it is just so much greater than any of the fellowship we had in the Amish culture. Even though we do miss our families and our I brothers can only and sisters imagine. and that you know yeah. we do miss them i guess that would be the biggest sacrifice you have made that there are family who cannot speak with you or, or mm -hmm. fellowship with yeah. you or whatever the, the amish churches about all the amish churches in our community have told since there was a, a group of about half a dozen families that came out of the amish at the same time we did that the churches all of the churches in in our community the bishops announced it, that if it's their children that is part of this group they're not allowed to allow them to come into their homes. Hmm. Other than just to tell them that you need to go back to your bishops and your ministers and do what they require from, for you to do before you can have anything to do with your family to get together. Yeah. Uh, so, but to this day, I can still go to my parents' house and we do go, we haven't quit Good. that. Good. Even though that was sad. Right. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time praying and praying and asking a lot of people to pray for us at the same time. Yes. Because there was a lot of times uh, we we went back to our, after we'd been excommunicated, we still went back for about three years and not welcome to our mm. church. Because we thought, well, nobody tried this, so we're going to try something different. Right. Just go back and try to show them love, that we still love them and care for them. We figured maybe someone would come up with a question, come to our house and ask, why are you, why are you coming back? Why are you doing these things? So that would provide us an opportunity, but it never happened. Nobody ever came. Nobody ever showed up. That's when we started our house church. Okay. But to this day, we don't go to her family, but I was able to somehow, God providing, to keep the door open, we can go to my parents' house. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of conversations with my, my, my parents. Uh, but he still don't approve of what I'm doing, but he, he welcomes me into his house. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. You pretty much lose all your friends, family, and everybody. No Christmas dinners, there's no Sunday afternoon dinners, no Thanksgiving dinners, no nothing. No birthday parties, you don't eat in the house, nothing. Right. I just... understand it also affects business in certain regards Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all this sacrifice that you've had to go through, 
Do you believe it's been worth it? Oh, I'd yes. do it again. I'd do it again. Absolutely. And why? One thing, it changes us. Okay. It changes me from who I am. Okay. It, it also keeps me from looking at myself, what I'm able to do. Because I, when I first was excommunicated, the reason for state, well, I'm sure it was a thing to do in a lot of ways. One thing I always had in my mind that I will some way change the Amish, my community, okay. my family. Until I've tried and tried and tried, went back to the church again and again after they excommunicated, took the membership totally away and have nothing to do with us. I had in my mind, we will change them. Until one day, I was so desperate, I was working at the sawmill. I said, God, I've tried everything, I've done anything, I don't know what else to do. I guess you'll have to do it. Yeah. And it also, uh, at the same time, uh, first when we were excommunicated, you, 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 there's the bitterness of trying to rise up inside, which did, mm -hmm. saying, that bishop just didn't do that right thing of excommunicating me and trying to say that he can hand me over to Satan. Therefore, I could turn to God and say, Lord, I need to get rid of that bitterness. Right. I need to be able to forgive these people if I want to be your witnesses because I cannot get angry and be your witnesses at the same time. And the Bible says, the angerness of man will never accomplish the righteousness of God. Therefore, we learn how to deal with our issues instead of packing up moving out of the house and moving out of the community, we stayed and worked through the issues. And it wasn't easy. But as soon as we agree that we need help, then, then there can also be healing. Yes. As long as we deny that we have a problem, then there never can be any healing. We need to be honest with ourselves who we are, and then, then go to God and say, God, I have a problem. Amen. The sooner we do that, the sooner we have healing, and the sooner we can go on, and the, the, the faster we can grow. So that's one reason why we didn't move out. We were also highly encouraged not to move out of the community. Okay. One thing, number one was, who's going to stay back to witness to the community? Right. Since we had a history of, in the past, a lot of people packed up and left. They, we, we're not dealing with issues. We're, good, we're getting out of here. We decided to stay, because who will be the witnesses if we move out? That was one reason. Secondly is, it taught us how to get over our anger and bitterness for the, our own church people who were mistreating us. We felt like we were mistreated, but if you look at what Joseph said to his brothers, you know, as the story goes with Joseph and his brother when they got together, and they couldn't believe that this is Joseph years and years and years later that was being their provider, providing food for them. It's like they were like, oh, you know, I can imagine them all sitting around in a circle and say, we just can't. We we just can't say sorry enough for what we've done to you. But what was Joseph's answer? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. So, God, so I look at the same way. God's in this. It was Him leading us through all this process. So I can't get angry at the people because the Bible talks about it. it's not between flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual mm. warfare going on. I know that people don't realize what's going on, but. We do so if we understand that we need to forgive them. We need to go back to love them again and again. And to this day, it's been a tremendous blessing to live right where we're at. But if we wouldn't have had people to go to and say, can you please pray for us? Because we had nowhere. We didn't know where to turn. Right. Many times, we didn't know whether we we're going to hitch up that horse and buggy next morning to go back to church because all we see is errors pointing at us. You're in the wrong. You're on your way to hell. There's no way. You're, uh, no way you can get to anywhere until you go come back and say you're sorry that what we believe is wrong and that what we have promised on our on our knees when we got baptized as Amish members we will never be acceptable back accepted back in the uh, church okay well let me ask this question I'll start with Susie on it and Stephen I'd like your input on it as well um, it's probably difficult to come up with one thing but if you could what would be the most important lesson or truth that you've learned that you could share with others that were in your situation or with others in general? What would that be? Well, if I look look at it as some of my friends that were women, I mean, the biggest thing for everybody in general is Jesus. Yeah. 
one thing that it taught me when we were shunned and like none of our families would, well my family especially, didn't talk with us, didn't respond to any letters I send or any cards I send or like if I'd go to the store and I'd see my brother, he, he turned to the wall and I could tell that he tried to ignore me and you know, all that. And one day I was in the garden working and I was just kind of complaining to God about all this. Like, why do they have to do this? Why can't they see the truth, you know? And I, I, at the same time, I was reading through Exodus about the children of Israel and how much they longed to go back to Egypt and have the, the leeks and the onions and all the, the good stuff they had in Egypt. And I couldn't understand how they could want to go back there. Like, in my mind I was like, don't you remember how, you know, how bad they treated you and everything else? And all of a sudden it was, I just heard this voice saying, that's who you are. That's, you know, that you're exactly the same. There's no difference. And I was like, really? I didn't want to be that person. But at the same time, I knew that that was the only way that we would come to the place where we would only want Jesus. Amen. Because if, our fa if my family would have agreed with us or would have been on, you know, if we would go to their house and if they would have associated with us, I don't think I, I would have been that close to Jesus. Okay. I, I, w I would have wanted my family and Jesus. Okay, yeah. But because they didn't associate with me, I had no place to go except Jesus. So that was one thing. On the women's side, for him, when he came to the truth and saw that this is the truth and, you know, there's, there's, this is it. It, it happened like that for me, but not, for me, it was more of a struggle. Like, I knew I was saved, but some other day I'd do something and I'm like, well, am I for sure safe now or not? I struggled with that a lot more than my husband did. And I, I would, you know, think about this and think about this. One thing I learned, for the most part, men tell what they think and okay, they talk about it and that's it. <laughs> Women think about it and talk about it until there is nothing to think or say. And that was exactly me. I wanted every question answered and everything, but it took me a while to think through it until I even asked the questions. And so that really, I really struggled with that until one day I thought, well, what did I do when I became saved? I prayed and Jesus forgave me. And I thought, well, that's so simple. Why did I never think about this? I just need to pray again and ask him to forgive me. And then I came to this verse in John 17 where it's, um, Jesus was talking to his disciples because I was struggling with how do I know for sure that this is truth? Because when, when this forester guy would come to our house and I mean he always had loads to, to explain to us about the Bible and I was, I was struggling with like when he was there I, was, I believed it 100% I knew it was true in my mind I knew it was true but the next day when I would start thinking about it and at the same time think about what my mom and dad would say or the church people would say, I was like, how do I know what is true? How do I know for sure that this is true and I will not be deceived in anything? Until I came to this verse in the Bible, um, it's John 17, 17. Mm -hmm. It says... I can't remember the first, the first line, but the last line is, Thy word is it's truth. truth. Yeah. It's truth. And I was like, wow, the Bible even says it is truth. <laughs> I don't have to question anymore. I know now that it is the truth. So that was there a was very big step for big me. Big step for you. I appreciate both viewpoints as well. That's helpful. How about you, Stephen? One thing that I think helped me a lot when I look back is that the good thing was <clears throat> I love to read. I read a lot of magazine before I was a, a Bible follower. And when I started 
sticking my nose in the Bible and reading it, I couldn't stop. It was so interesting. It's like I was drag, uh, pulling this wagon of loads, wagon loads of, of garbage. Yeah. And the more I read, the more, uh, the sooner another wagon got unhooked. And it's, it's, as the Bible says, it's Jesus, Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. And it's His truth that sets us free. Jesus Himself sets us free from our bondages. Because He gives us something brand new. When I came, to, when I started reading through Romans, talked a lot about the, the Jewish laws. Mm -hmm. And I looked at our rules as similar. That how the Jewish were trying to keep a set of rules, but the Bible talks about the law was a tutor or a schoolmaster to point him to Christ. Well, ours didn't point anything to Christ; it was just to point you to be an Amishman. But when I, when then when I uh, jumped to Galatians, I was reading through Galatians, talks about uh, Galatians five, I think it talks about those who have been severed in Christ, here are justified by the law, have fallen from grace. And I just thought, that's just totally incredible. So I have accepted Christ, His blood, as my atonement, bought me from sin. But if I turn to a set of rules or regulations, I remove myself under that blessing. And I just thought, my people have to know this. Mm. So, number two is, how much do we spend studying God's Word? The more you study, the more you learn, and the more it can set you free. Of course, we have to do more than just study it and, jump and, and read it, store information. We need to then repent. Then I can think, what I learned through our life of, of Christianity is that you have information. I always felt good about having information. But if you never do anything with it, it doesn't do any good. Because if you, if you don't have, if you, um, if you don't repent, when God asks you to repent, when you find out, oh, I do have a problem, but I deny it, then, I, then there's no repentance, then there's no, no uh, healing. But when I come to, if I have an anger problem, then God, I have this anger problem. And then it's like, uh, we would work, we'll have a discussion with one of our guys that he said, I always blow off my top. That I just, that's just part of his nature. He just blows off, you know, if he can control, before he can control himself. I said, there's this thing about, I said, the Bible talks about God's mercy being new every day. Mm -hmm. And Jesus also uh, said to his disciples, talks about one of them how often shall I you know, forgive my brother seven times a day or something? Jesus said, seven times 70. So what does that mean? Seven times 70 is 490 times a day for the one sin. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, next day you get angry again. So what do you do? Ask God to forgive you and, and be honest with yourself. And then he washes the all clean on it again. Then, then what if happens the, the day three, when you do the same thing? Then day four, what if happens again and do the same thing? Then there comes a wonderful day where you'd rather be clean than dirty. Mm -hmm. And it works. It works. And my encouragement to anybody that comes from a community where we did, as an Amish community, is, is somebody needs to explain, there needs to be somebody around who can explain what the Bible's talking about. I know not everybody is a reader, but there's something about reading the Word. It is just encouraging. It helps you to grow. It helps you to see who you are. It's like I was listening to um, a preacher recently. He said, a mirror is, the, and the Bible talks about being like a mirror. He said, it, it shows us who we are, but you don't fall into the mirror. It don't clean you. It just shows you who you are. Same way with the law. The law wasn't meant to clean us. It could never clean us. But it showed us who we are. But then we, then God gave His Son, Jesus, to cleanse us. Because He's the living Word. And He desires you that more than anything. And there's nowhere else we can go to find cleansing and become holy than turning to the, the, living, the written Word and the living Word. Amen. Amen. Is there anything I didn't cover in... in sitting with you and discussing this. Is there anything that you would like to add before we close? I mean, I appreciate all the, the insights and the information. And I have to tell you personally, it, it has been an, an honor and a privilege to sit here and speak with both of you, knowing the sacrifices that you've made, knowing the commitment you have to the Lord, 
and how blessed I am. And every answer that you gave, you referenced scripture, which is rare, unfortunately, in, in what, the body of Christ. Just but to you, inject you, a little bit uh, go ahead. a comment into this. Um, now that after we went through, we lo I've, I'm hearing story, a lot of stories from what the Muslims go through. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, we haven't even faced anything what they face. It was difficult going through this shunning. And I seen it coming long before it came. And I was struggling very much at work one day when I was grading lumber. I was running the question through my mind, what the ministers will ask me when they find out that I'm a, I'm a different believer, that I believe differently from what mm. they do. Or they ever find out that I'm intending Bible, secret Bible studies. They will come to my house and ask me all kinds of questions. And I try to ask myself those questions. Then I try to go to the Bible and find those questions that I would answer them with, with their question they bring. I mean, yeah, provide answers for their questions. Yeah. I did it for a whole day, for two days, until one day I came home from work. I was so exhausted. I was totally exhausted. Because I was fighting with the idea of being excommunicated from the church, thrown out of the church, where, where communication and taking from your anything from your hand or having any kind of fellowship or, or meal sharing would all be shunned. I dreaded, you know, facing that someday. But I knew I couldn't turn back. No way now. I, I have too much truth that is way too good to trade for anything else. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. The life that Jesus provides is just up and beyond that life that I have ever lived. And when I came from or home from Rockingham right after eight Sabbath, walking outside in the driveway, and I just finally said, "God, this load is just too heavy. I can't carry it no more. It's too heavy. Hmm. If it means to go through the process of being excommunicated in front of my church, where everybody will see it and and look at me and condemn me or or, or whatever accusation, I'm willing to go through it." All of a sudden, I just felt like a flying bird. The weight just lifted. The thing of it is, I was trying to deal with the issue myself. I was trying to find the answer for the questions. I was trying to have everything all lined up so I would have an answer for every question that they would come with until it gets too heavy. When it come, when you come to that point, you, you got to, God, it's yours. I can't deal with it. I, yes. I, I'm just totally exhausted. Yes. So when, the, when I actually went through that process that day, I was shocked when I walked out of church that day. They asked me to leave and after they okay. announced us that we're no more part of the church. And they, there's a saying he goes through drawing out of first or second Trinity talks about handing over to Satan for the destruction yes. of flesh. A lot of people think, well, now you're going to go to hell as soon as that's said. Well, I knew that who I have. I knew that Jesus never, confused, never mm -hmm. uh, accuses anybody, never rejects anybody. And if I wouldn't have studied the Bible and knew the truth that I did before that, it would have been a tremendous struggle. I might have turned around and went back to the church again. Right. It was the Bible that helped me through that process. The Bible that I looked to for answers. That, and Jesus is the way. That's the only way I could survive through this. Amen. And with that freedom, it's obvious to me, comes a joy that is unspeakable because it's, all over, it's all over you. Yeah, you, you can't hand it to no. someone else. And I got it from the Bible. I spent hours and hours and hours searching through the Bible, reading the Bible morning and evening, and praying and praying. And there's people praying. We had prayer, prayer meetings and read Bible studies. But even myself, getting in that Bible, and I had truth in my mind. I could see how the Jews were going through, struggling over their laws and their traditions and all the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the tradition they added to the law yet. That's what we're doing in a lot of, in, a, in a pretty much the same way. And I thought, well, that's that's where we fail. That's where we're stumbling. Yes. And I, I just seen it as clear as, I, you just can't hand it to someone else. Right. All I can do is go to the Bible and show someone else the truth that I was understanding. That's our duty, show, point the, the people to the Bible. Actually, our job is to point them to Jesus through the God's Word. Mm -hmm. And he does the rest. Yes. He does the rest. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you much. For answering my questions. Pleasure getting to know you, Susie. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't imagine how this couldn't be powerful to you. I can't add anything to, uh, more to what they've said. So uh, I know you'll be blessed if you watch this. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you again. Until then, Lord bless your day.